Hello, everyone. I'm going to let you guys come in and give everyone a second to log on before we get started. People coming in. Oh, good. I'm so glad everyone's here to spend their Tuesday night with us. It's Tuesday, right? This week's been <laughs> all the same. Uh huh. Every event, I'm like, oh, it's Wednesday. Yes, it's Thursday. No, it's, oh, okay, whatever. <laughs> okay, guys. Well, I'm gonna get started. People can come in. They won't miss much of the introduction. Um, I'm Megan. I'm the events coordinator here at Park Road Books. We're very excited to have Jen Phillips and Julia Claiborne Johnson here tonight to discuss family law. The panelists this evening will spend the first part of the event having a conversation with each other, and we'll just be observing that. Um, if you have any questions or comments that you want to make during this time, submit them in the Q&A, which is at the bottom of your screen, or you can put them in the chat. I will grab from both of those places in the last 15 or so minutes of the event where, where I will share those comments with them or those questions with Jen or Julia or both. Um, a note on the books, we have signed copies of both of them actually here at Park Road Books and we ship them. You can come in with a mask. We, we, can, we can ship pretty much everywhere and we also offer curbside pickup. So any way you want it, we can get it. Um, that being said, I have to say this night is a virtual event. I have to remind everybody of our zero tolerance policy in regards to harassment. If you harass anyone, I will expel you from the event and you will be expelled from all future Park Road Books events. I'm sure that won't be a problem. I'm sure we'll have a perfectly nice conversation, but I ha it has to be said. Mm -hmm. um, so lastly, I will introduce our author and our host. So our author tonight is Jen Phillips. She's the author of six novels, ranging from historical fiction to literary thriller to a middle grade book. Her work has been sold in 29 countries. Jen's debut novel, The Well and the Mine, won the 2009 Barnes, no Barnes and Noble Discover Award. Her recent novel, Fierce Kingdom, was named one of the best books of 2017 by Publisher Weekly, NPR, Amazon, and Kirkus Reviews. Her novels have been named as selections for Indie Next, Book of the Month, in the Junior Library Guild. She was born in Montgomery, Alabama, and Jen graduated from Birmingham Southern College with a degree in political journalism. She lives with her family in Birmingham, Alabama. Our host, Julia Claiborne Johnson. Julia is the author of the best-selling Be Frank With Me, a finalist for the American Booksellers Association Best Debut Novel, Novel Award, and Better Luck Next Time. She grew up on a farm in Tennessee before moving to New York City where she worked at Mademoiselle and Glamour magazines. She now lives in Los Angeles with her comedy writer husband and their two children, one of which I met tonight, which helped her you set know, up her new. Yes. <laughs> um, like I said, signed copies are available. I'm gonna let them speak. If you have any questions or comments, please put them in the Q&A feature and we will get to them at the end. Take it away, guys. So oh, this is very exciting, Jen. Can I quickly tell the story of how I know Jen? Because I love this story. Sure, well, although I think you overestimate your creepiness, but go ahead. One of my bookseller friends at uh, East City Bookshops in uh, Washington, DC, gave me an advanced copy of Jen's book. And I read it on a train and I loved it. It was uh, The Fierce Kingdom, the one before this. And I was so thrilled about it. And then I saw she was coming to California for her book tour. So I went to her event and a book had come out like the day before or something. And after it, I like rushed to the front. I said, oh my God, I loved your book. And she looked a little terrified. I don't remember the terror. <laughs> and then two years passed and I got an email from her. She said, I just read your book and I really loved it. And I was like, Jen, we have met. So then we became friends after that. So thank you for having me be your interlocutor. And also thank you to Park Road Books for having us tonight, because that is very nice. So let's talk about this book, Family Law. Tell me where your idea came from, because it's it's a super fabulous book, a quick, exciting read. So um, thank you. And first of all, let me add my own thanks to Park Road. And for everybody who's here and visible, we appreciate you. Um, well, my last book, Fierce Kingdom, was about motherhood. 
very overtly, although it was a fast paced book about motherhood. And this is as well, um, although this is about the mothers we choose instead of the mothers we're born to. Mm-hmm. So I grew up, so the, the book deals with, uh, has two central characters. There's Lucia, who's a young lawyer at a time when a woman in the courtroom was still rare in the 70s and 80s Alabama. And then there's Rachel, who's a teenager from a family where there's a very strict notion of what it means to be a girl. Mm -hmm. I was raised very similarly to Rachel and Montgomery from a very conservative, traditional world. And there were a lot of women for me, no, nobody resembling, um, nobody with the professional accomplishments of Lucia, but a lot of women, mainly teachers, who really showed me a different way of being. Mm-hmm. So it really struck me after, after Fierce Kingdom, and I did a lot of talking about motherhood there, I really came away from that book thinking, you know, there's really sort of this whole other side to motherhood for me that do, it doesn't get touched on the... in touched on in the previous book at all, and that I really haven't read much about, that notion of how women outside your family shape you and show you what kind of self you want to be. So I found that really interesting. You know, I think, I don't know, I guess for some people, they grow up to be exactly the person their parents thought they would be. I think for most of us, there is some gap there between who we were expected to be and who we became. And, and I liked playing with that gap a little of how you, how you pick yourself. Mm-hmm. That's really interesting. Cause you know, when I worked at Mademoiselle magazine, I worked in the fiction department for the fiction editor. And I always thought of her as the mother I never had. And my own mother was fabulous. Like there were no flies on her, but you know, she was a doctor. And then there was the fiction writer person. And it was like, sort of, I hadn't really thought about it that way, but that is exactly the same kind of thing that you're talking about, so. Yeah, I mean, I think even when we have great parents, I think, you know, you get to those teenage years and I think you're always curious about what else is out there. And maybe you pick and choose different bits and pieces from different people. But, you know, when you're you're talking about writing, I think that's part of it, just to find when you have a passion for something that that the people in your life don't share when you meet the person who has a passion for that too it's really exciting to realize what else you know that this is a way to be this is this is a model so in this book lucia is an, a lawyer and she meets rachel and rachel is very taken with her from the get-go and what do you think it was about her in particular and how they met like sort of explain tell, tell us about how they came together in the first place well, they, so Lucia and Rachel meet because Rachel's mother comes into Lucia's office to, to uh, sort of in the preliminary stages of thinking about divorce. Mm-hmm. Lucia doesn't really meet many children. Uh, that's still fairly standard that you wouldn't usually, you know, the sort of conversations that go on in a, in a family lawyer's office are usually not considered that fit for kids. Uh-huh. Um, and so, you know, but I think for, for Rachel, I mean, this is a time, and this is true, not just in Alabama, but it's certainly over much of the country, but in the late 70s in the book when they meet, mm-hmm. uh, it would have been normal to have, mm-hmm, it would have been normal to have one or two, maybe three women in a law school class. Mm-hmm. It's a time in Alabama where, yeah, there were no, to have a woman functioning as a lawyer of any kind was still unusual. Uh, so, mm-hmm. Separate, I think, from the law, there's just this notion for Rachel of you've just met someone who does something that you didn't know could be done. Mm-hmm. I, don't, I don't know that it's the specifics so much as she's not following any of the rules that have been laid out for you. Mm-hmm. Of sort of don't make a fuss, follow the crowd, just don't question too much. She's someone who's questioned a lot. And also, this is also like my own upbringing, Rachel, there has this sense or has always been told the world is sort of a terrifying place. There's this long list of things you should not do because you don't know what will happen. You know, that you always got to make sure your doors are locked, but you probably don't want to drive on the interstate unless you have to, that you, that you, um, oh, you probably want to take your car to the gas station to have a man check the tires because you may not be able to check the tires correctly. Um, And suddenly there's this woman who is fearless. Mm -hmm. And I think that fearlessness is very appealing to her. And it's it's something the book plays with some is that notion of of fear of what you do with that. Once you realize the world has real dangers in it, 
mm -hmm. which we all agree it does. You know, how do you respond to that? Yeah, because her mother has a very different reaction to danger. Like it sort of makes her more closed off and, and uh, Lucia just runs right into it. She's like ready for a scrap, which I loved about that. So she just isn't afraid if someone's mad at her, which I really admire that she has, I think sort of no sense that or, or very, there's no part of her that feels like it matters to her if someone likes her or doesn't like her. And that's, there is a part of me thinks like, what a freeing way that would be to live. <laughs> awesome. Um, how did you come up with Lu Lucia? Like what inspired her in particular? Did you have sort of a template for her? Oops. I do, you know, I mean, I think probably every character I've ever created has is some hodgepodge of people. Mm -hmm. I can think of maybe, uh, I mean, there's, I'm sure an exception or two to that, but um, for the, there's always some of me, I don't know how you ever write any, anyone that's not at least part of yourself, okay. but uh, years ago, more than a decade ago now, I, I was freelancing some, geez, it must have been more like 12 or 13 years ago, and, um, and I met a lawyer here in Birmingham, mm -hmm. a family lawyer, mm -hmm. and I was told before I went to interview her, like, she's terrifying, like, just, it will be like, just brace yourself. And she wasn't terrifying at all. She was delightful and charming. And she told me stories about her early days in law. And when I walked out of the office, I was really taken with sort of like the rumors, the, the, mm -hmm. the rumored version of her, I think still mostly from people who never even met her and the reality. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And then, so when I, when I started thinking about, I would like to write something about sort of the mothers we choose. That popped back into my head and I, I started thinking about what if a girl like me had met someone like her. Mm -hmm. uh, and so she has some, her career experience is, is, is very similar to the real life lawyers. Um, mm -hmm. The sort of cases she handles, the kind of uh, absurd harassment that she faces. Mm -hmm. And, but then there are other parts of just women who mattered to me that, that find their way in there as well. Love. So I think I also picked and, cho picked and chose. Yes. Yeah. It seems like a weird, weird verb tense uh, from a couple of women who, who were close to me when I was a teenager and who really kind of reached out to me. So, uh, but yeah, I like this. her sort of backbone. I always think of that as like the skeletal, the structure underneath is sort of a real life lawyer and, and that very lawyerly sense of, of enjoying conflict. Yeah, uh, you did such a good job of nailing the lawyer. So it's like, wait a minute, was Jim like a lawyer before? Because my brother is a lawyer in Birmingham. And I was like, so then I was Googling going, wait, no, I think, wait a minute. I think she's used her imagination and her <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's really totally spot on and I really loved that about it so I mean I think you know I think that's kind of it's it is becoming more common mm -hmm. but it felt really important to show why she loves her work that she and and how she's good at it and how that sense of you know of being good at your job is both satisfying and a source of joy yeah um and, and so, yeah, you know, it was important that some of those office scenes and courtroom scenes get in there because it's, it's fairly central to who she is. Yeah, because, you know, I don't know about you, but it was very important to me that I made 100 on every test. And if I made a 98, my father would say, why didn't you make 100 kind of thing? And, you know, I, I saw that in Lucia, too. I was like, she really has to be the best at everything. And that is great. And she learned how to, like, channel that and not just eat herself alive with nothing at the end and just go right. place with it. So. No, and, I think that's a weird thing you just brought up too. I mean, that, that I certainly felt that and I don't know how much this has changed, but it felt to me like in the eighties and nineties sort of women, I mean, your, your mom was a doctor, but my mother was a school teacher and mm -hmm. most of her friends were school teachers and she had a strong sense. Like you could be a, a teacher or a nurse. Mm -hmm. Those, for your basic option. Everybody's going to kind of funnel you there. Uh -huh. So then I think that generation raises kids and there's a stronger sense for their girls of you. You can do whatever you want. You should make straight A's. You can go to college and sort of what you're saying, make a hundred on every test, achieve in every way you can achieve, get a scholarship. So you do all that. Then you get through college and then you live your life. 
-hmm. And that to me is where the problem comes in that then I think that generation of parents was made and then certainly in Lucia's case mm -hmm. sort of feels like but you were supposed to stop you were supposed to yeah just start it off. and do everything and then you were supposed to get married and have kids and and feel like that was plenty for your life so now what are you doing we we're supposed to be done with this a while back um and that's part of the issue for her is you you feel like I'm not who you raised me to be. And yet, I'm you, you, you kind of steered me right here where I am. You know, my mother went to medical school and there's a part in your book where that she's in law school or she's become a lawyer and the guy says, you're never going to practice or something like that. Because it was the same thing they said. It was exactly- It was like, why did you take it? You need to justify taking the spot away from a man. That's exactly what it was. Because that's what they said to my mother. And I was like, wow, you know, and I, when you, that really rang true with me. I was like, oh, go, you know, go get it. So I and that, that was standard. Like that is the crazy part that that's not a random comment that it is. A, it is a very common thread when you talk to women from that generation and that it was just considered a reasonable question. Why would we give you a spot? Yeah. So, um, and you know, the other thing that's interesting to me vis-a-vis -vis the two of us is both our books are about divorce, but they're from different angles. And we were talking about how all the crazy laws that they still had in Alabama like in the seven, mm -hmm. do you want to talk about that some? Because I love that. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think I, there were, I liked setting the book in the 70s and 80s because it was a really transitional time where you still had pretty hardcore, those rigid boxes set of mm -hmm. men and women, black and white, right and wrong, mm -hmm. all the old traditional structure set but it was starting to fall apart. There was starting to be real push from different angles um, to make, to, to shatter those boxes. But I also liked the idea of setting the book there because I, you know, I remember it. And then there is a real that I knew I'd sort of need to teach myself some law. And um, you know, there's, a, there's the whole legal angle that wasn't familiar to me. There are several angles of the book, the police side and the several scenes that might have required plenty of research, but I liked the idea of I know the real textures of the 70s and 80s. I remember them. I mean, I remember them as a child. Mm -hmm. But so, yeah, you know, one thing that was really powerful about writing it was realizing what was going on when I was alive, <laughs> that, that mm -hmm. I had this sense of, you know, sort of, yes, women used to be treated as property and things weren't equal, but I do think I had more of a sense that that was, say, back in the frontier days, uh -huh. um, that we we're talking about, you know, 100, 200 years ago. And instead, I found out, you know, that in 1977, women uh, weren't, if you were married, and you had your own property as a woman, say your parents left you their house or say you own your own business, uh -huh. you couldn't sell that business or that house without your husband's signature. That is crazy. Uh, until 79, if my child was injured in a car wreck and I wanted to sue um, the delivery company that caused the wreck, I couldn't do that as a woman. Only a father could file suit for their minor child, unless he was in a mental institution or dead or prison. Um, so they give you that. <laughs> but you know, a lot of those little bits and pieces um, of how how late say women could really serve equally on juries, it just all is so much more recent than I realized. And that part was very interesting to realize. I think for a lot of women around my age. Mm -hmm. to realize what was going on in your childhood, how, how close all that is, some really, you know, some, some, some really legalized inequalities mm -hmm. that were, that are not that long ago. Yeah, it's interesting to think about, because now I'm, I'm much older than you, but the, the Vietnam War was going on when I was a kid, and they would talk about the gorilla fight, and I was like, why are the gorillas fighting? <laughs> I didn't understand what it was, so. Do you want to read a little bit before we talk some more? Or? Sure, that is a good time. To uh -huh. Okay. What I really like is I did this, you know, the page 69 test? Oh, yes. Tell, tell everybody. I love this thing. So somebody was asking me to do a, a little piece, um, a little written piece about uh, the page 69 test, which is where you open any book to page 69. Mm -hmm. And it should give you a good the theory is it gives you 
just the right view of what that book is about. So if you enjoy page 69, then you should buy the book. And so the, the point was sort of, does this work or not? But, but what I found was it's the perfect page, actually. It's now like my first choice page usually to read oh, nice. the book is page 69. So I will just put a little plug in for that I test seems you. to work pretty well. Um, so I, this is very brief. I realize we're on Zoom where attention spans are not necessarily at their, at their longest. Um, but we have, so we have both women, both Lucia and Rachel in the story, we get to know a good bit about their families and their families have some similarities and differences. But this is a scene uh, at Sunday lunchtime with Lucia and her mother. Lucia's gone over to her childhood home um, and they are getting lunch ready. Mm -hmm. It's one of my, it's one of my favorite scenes because I do love, I mean, I think for, Again, that's probably a pretty common memory. The thought of all this, the, the details of the kitchen, of the specific Pyrex containers and where the Tupperware containers go and um, that it is a very familiar feel for Lucia and it's a fairly familiar feel to me. So here we go with, with Lucia and her mother. There was a reason that they talked in the kitchen. Dumplings and jello salads filled the empty spaces. The past could do that too. It was as if the two of them were standing far apart, separated by a huge bed sheet, a wide flat expanse. One old story would fold up the distance, bring them close, corner against corner. Tomato, her mother reminded. Lucia reached into the far right drawer where the sharp knife stayed and the lace curtains blew against her arm. Her mother had opened a window after all and the familiarness of it washed over Lucia. She knew this place. She knew the cereal cabinet squeaked, making it dangerous to snitch Rice Krispies, which were kept not in a box, but in a Tupperware cylinder in the wee hours of the night. In the drawer under the toaster, you could find every possible variation of aluminum foil, saran wrap, and sandwich bags. Bacon grease was collected in a Crisco tin by the sink. The view out every kitchen window was all leaves and branches. The curtains were tacky, but she loved how the hot air blew through the mesh screens and the green of the trees pulsed. Most of the time, she could barely remember the girl who had lived in this house, but there were moments, lace fluttering, wind smelling of honeysuckle and bacon and barbecue lays. There were moments where she was right under Lucia's skin. I saw the piece in the paper, her mother said. I saved a copy. About the counseling center? The women who called uh, had trouble with their husbands, I suppose, and you'd, you'd tell them if they should get a divorce. I'd tell them what options they had, Lucia said. If they wanted to leave, I'd tell them how to do it smartly, like to take the children with them because judges don't like it when the mother leaves the children behind, that kind of thing. Such a fuss, her mother said. Lucia finished peeling the tomato focused on the narrow margin between peel and flesh. Oh my God, you know, that's bad because it, that makes me think of my father had a tomato peeling light, knife that didn't have a handle anymore and it was his most precious thing. <laughs> now I wonder what happened to it. Like he cherished it. And the, remember the juice glasses you had that used to be, have jelly in them? Like when you oh, yes. did that, I totally pictured. <laughs> it's a little bit of no, A good tomato that. knife is important. Yeah, so... Now I can picture each, I'm like my grandmother's tomato knife, as well as my great aunt's that you just, you had that knife. That that is knife. Knife. So it's really, I love the way you were able to create a world of all of that. And um, it's interesting. Yeah, I watched a thing that you did with uh, Josh Rowan Jackson and she read your book and you were talking about how when the people auditioned for it, like some of them didn't get an accent right. And I was very careful for mine to pick somebody who was from North Carolina because I was like, British guys and Southern people can get it right. But sometimes the others do not. <laughs> There's a little too much going on. But no, there is a real difference in someone doing Southern versus Southern. I mean, and it's funny to me that a lot of the readers were from the South, but they were still sort of doing a whole Thanks. different, a whole di just, there are just, you know, subtleties that there are. I got a lot of like Dukes of Hazard type voices for, for Lucia, which that is not to say that I don't have family members who sound 
mm-hmm. sort of like the Dukes of Hazard, and people I love may have a much stronger accent, but you know, they're different. It's coded differently that that there's sort of a gone with the wind accent and there's Dukes of Hazard accent. And most people do one of those. Yeah. Where most people who actually live here speak do not do not speak either one of those. It's no. a little more complicated. So, so what was your favorite part of this book to write? Because so many parts of it are so awesome that I'm just like very interested to see which part you enjoy the most. I mean, I always like the world building and the character and I always like the you know I'll always love the challenge of what can you show without saying a word about it specifically and so for that reason I mean it's why I like that page the whole the whole kitchen scene with Lucia and her mother Mm -hmm. um, I really like it both feels very familiar to me the the space itself, the sort of three-dimensional space is a space that it's not based on one particular house it's it's sort of pulled together from different things and from imagination, but it feels like a place I know. Um, and I loved starting out writing that scene of trying to convey what it's like to make conversation and to spend time with someone who you love deeply uh-huh. and who you have almost nothing in common with. Oh, um, interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I like that. So that, you know, a lot of times if you ask, I feel like surely this is true for you too. If you ask someone their favorite part, then almost surely it's a thing you had in your head that you had a really strong sense of what you wanted and uh-huh. it actually came out that way, which does not always happen. But that that scene for me is one that I had a real strong sense. And when I read it at the end, whatever else may be going on with it, it is what I wanted. <laughs> Which is, which is the most you can hope for. I captured the thing that was sort of um, floating around my head and captured in, in some sort of concrete form. It's easier said than done, too. I'm noticing a lot of sparkles in your hair, Jen. Yes, I have tinsel in my hair, which my stepdaughter did for me, so my hair would look awesome on. <laughs> look at I tell you, I went to my son. My son had sort of a year-end project, and my hair was super popular with all the all the fourth grade girls. <laughs> it's completely their aesthetic. Oh yeah, exactly. Um, the other really when you're talking about the her relationship with her mother, the other relationship that I really loved in your book was between her and her husband because they really love each other. But they go through some tense times, and then there's the part where she's in the hotel and the guy's eye in her, and she mm-hmm. sort of has this whole like, what would happen if I talked to him? And I, what I loved about that is it did not indicate there was anything wrong with their marriage. It was just like, no matter how happily married you are, I think that is a natural kind of thing. Right. That doesn't have to be any actual desire for an affair, but um, I just, yes, I think I've been married for, for whew, 12 years next, next week. Um, mm-hmm. And yeah, I mean, there, I feel like if no matter how happy you are, if, uh-huh. it, if you say you never think of like how fun that would be to be at the start of a relationship, like to, to catch someone's eye across the room and oh. wonder like, what if, yeah. however great your marriage is, what all the, and I wouldn't trade it, don't get me wrong, but like, you know, that's what you, that's what you don't have anymore. You'll never again look across the room and wonder what if. Yeah. And the thing that's great about it too, is because she's a divorce lawyer, she sort of deals with people who go they don't like stop and think oh maybe I shouldn't do this like she knows what she's got she's not going to screw it up and then there are other people who don't (laughs) you know no I love that idea that you I mean it seems to me like that might be at least with some divorce lawyers how that works you know that, that yes you that you were aware how foolish human beings can be yeah um, and that and and how much our tendencies to sort of blame our own stuff on someone else mm-hmm. and so that instead you might be ultra aware of your own part and yeah. appreciative yeah. of what your of what your partner has but yes I really I, it's another thing I really wanted to capture was just a okay. good marriage not a not a flawless one not a you know, not 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 one that feels like it's a Hollywood version one that feels real and yet yeah two people who enjoy each other and respect each other and are happy to be together which yeah. is not that it's another thing I feel like is not super common in literature of a happy marriage 
Well, it's because you need con conflict. It's that thing about Tolstoy. Is it Tolstoy who said happy marriages are all alike? Blah, blah, blah. You know the thing I'm talking about. So the others Tolstoy are- Tolstoy or Dickens? One of, the, one of them fellers. The, the part I found the most frustrating about um, your book, though, is like when the dad is talking about how he would read Hop on Pop to his kid every night and just think, oh, my God, I would do anything to get out of it. And now he's getting a divorce and he get out of it. I was like, oh, my God, that's so sad, you know, because it's such yeah. a case to be careful what you wish for. And it's the other thing, you know, it's the thing about those tidy boxes that everyone has to fit in, that there were some real downsides to that for women. And there were some real downsides to men that if you got divorced in 1980 and you were a man, unless there was something dramatically wrong that you could prove your wife was unfit, you were going to see your child for four days a month. That was, that was what you would get. And it was very clear cut that the, that the wife, whoever she is, is more fit to raise the children than you are. So now I wanted to do that again. Yeah. For the fact that Lucia has real sympathy for that, that her sort of feminism is not angled towards hating men. It is toward that she is just as sympathetic towards the notion that a man should be able to spend more time with his children as she is with a woman should be able to work if she wants to. Um, and yeah, you know, those, that kind of rigid thinking was um, it's just sort of harmful across the board, I think. Yeah, it's just so sad. The people can't get along. Anyway, but I've been married forever too. So, you know, I've got to, ha I've been married for 30 years. I can't even believe it. And I still think my husband is 27. He is not. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so you, when we were talking before this, about the 70s and 80s thing. And then I was like, I bet you've got some awesome pictures of yourself with AD Taylor. You know, I don't know if I have great, I'll tell you what I do, what I would love are some good bangs photos, which yeah, I do. The bangs were the thing. I don't know what happened there, but I will say, so I'll start out. We did talk about this. Not like I just keep these photos sitting yeah, right no, now. No, because I was like, shoulder pads and 80s bangs. So. But first I'll do 70s, mainly because I like my dad so much in this. And, and it sort of, speaks to how um like the pain of dressing for 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 church to me so okay this is i'm trying to not catch the glare here so this is me oh, and my dad uh this is after my parents were divorced i don't uh, know if you can see his ties his tie is pretty awesome it's uh -huh. a nice really wide stripe right. i have been shellacked into this dress with ridiculous <laughs> embroidery and i'm confident that my mother has used a lot of hairspray to make my hair lie flat and i can still feel like the pain of these bows always oh. um ah oh, the bows I didn't realize your parents were divorced. You must have told me that, but I've forgotten that. Oh, uh, yes. No, they've been divorced. My parents divorced when I was three. So, um, so yes, the divorce thing is fairly, yeah, it's, it's fairly well theory. known. I don't know, didn't, aren't everyone's parents divorced? <laughs> I feel and like my, that. My husband's parents, I guess. That's pretty much it. And I always say to my daughter, you don't know how rare it is to have like grandparents who are married to each other still. Okay. No. No, to have the whole, all the sets still married, I think is really unusual. Mm -hmm. um, and the other one is just this. I wish I could think, I think this must have been like maybe 85, but um, no, maybe more like, it has to be late 80s, but this was the year, I don't know if this was just down here, everybody got perms, everyone. Uh -huh. Anybody did not have naturally curly hair. Oh, I just realized this is Jenny's eighth grade school picture, age 13, 1988. So oh, thank you. Uh, thank you, mom. That was helpful. Uh -huh. um, and uh, no, you can't. I mean, I think I was still trying to make my bangs really big, but the perm was, the perm was kind, of, kind of affecting that. And I'll also just share briefly that so I was on school patrol. So this is when I was the junior traffic officer of the year for Montgomery City. Uh -huh. I don't know what I did, um, but I like my favorite part about this is that I say um, when they interview me, it's nice being captain, but I don't like getting up early. <laughs> and I feel like that captured some really deep uh -huh. core of myself. I like being in charge, uh -huh. but not at 7 a.m. Yeah, I no, would exactly. only like to be in charge like after nine. That's so, that's what I'm going for. A picture of you at 13, where you look like you're a little kid 
but that's at the part where you're starting to realize you're like about to be a grown up woman, woman, <laughs> like guys are looking at you. And in your book, there's like a really interesting thing going on between the next door neighbor and uh, Rachel, which you should talk about some, because I was always like, where's this going? Yeah, I got very anxious while I was reading. So yeah, and I always, I, I did this with Fierce Kingdom too, of like, you know, please don't read the book and think it's headed some terrible direction. There's no terrible direction. But I, but I also, you know, to me, if I think back to teenage years, I do think about, we send such mixed signals to girls, I think, about male attention and about how you should want it and you should have boys calling you and you should have a boyfriend and one day you should have a husband and yet there's a bad kind of male attention and maybe you're responsible for it if you get that kind of attention mm -hmm. um, but a lot of that is not really spoken out loud the, the but you feel it and I think you know especially in those teenage years trying to make sense of what kind of attention you're getting of if that guy touched me was that on purpose or not I don't feel comfortable with the way someone's looking at me but am I just imagining that you know all those thoughts of sort of what's a real threat what's a reasonable reason to be uncomfortable um, and how that all fits in with attraction or flirtation is just complicated when you're starting out trying to figure that out. And especially I think when you've also been taught to be polite, to make sure never to be rude to anyone. And so, you know, a lot of what Rachel's wrestling with is trying to figure out, yeah, am I, is it fair to be uncomfortable? Mm -hmm. And, and I, you know, would say, yes, I'll like in any scenario that it would be nice maybe if more of us realize that earlier. Um, if you're uncomfortable, you're uncomfortable. And mm -hmm. there's a reason that don't, that, that I think Rachel really wrestles with the sense of sort of whether, which voices to listen to, her own or all the other various voices talking in her head. She's not going to want to go to her mother and say, because her mother's going to just lose her mind if she like right. brings it up so and you know you also are in an age where you want to be a grown woman mm -hmm. you want at the same time you're sort of nervous of what that might mean you also don't want to be a kid anymore um and it's again it's a mess I wouldn't go back to that age for anything oh my god 13 just it's too horrible to think about <laughs> so, um, but you know what's interesting to me too is like we talked about this a little before is how like when you don't kind of, you don't want to ask your mother, you kind of don't know what to, who to go to. And you like go for advice to television shows. And there's like a whole thread in your book about heart to heart and like sort of what would, I don't remember what the wife's name in heart to heart was. What would she Jennifer. do? In Jennifer. Or Stephanie Powers, if you want them. Exactly. What would she do in this situation? It was, you know, what of that, what would Stephanie do, right? <laughs> and that just cracked me up because I was like, yes, that's exactly what you would do it it's really not because the whole every hollywood thing is based on conflict they're not going to make the smart choices because then there's no drama and right. the fact you're going to that for advice is so boneheaded and 13 and yet you do it so and you know i think you this is just different i mean if i think about the the, the world that my child and his friends grow up in it's so different it's so much broader than my world was at his same age but you know for me at that age and I have a feeling for a lot of friends I don't know there's like 20 channels on your television you're not traveling much you're not having this wide range of people come into your life that if you're trying to figure out what is adulthood and what's some other model of adulthood other than my parents um you know, you look at TV and try to glean something from it. Mm -hmm. Heart to heart was not the most realistic choice, but it is, it is an escapist choice. I mean, it's lovely to think that, you know, that adult life would be a show. It'll be exciting and adventurous. Um, there'll be travel and wine and nothing bad will ever happen. People will pick your clothes out for you, which I find very exciting to think about. But, you know, Ra Rachel would go over to Lucia's house and like watch her through the window, like, like TV, not in a creepy way, right. just she wanted to see it. And I was like, oh, it's her, like her TV show. Right. No, it's a similar impulse that I don't think that she doesn't put together of just some kind of desperate need to figure out what else is out there. What, 
what could I be? And to try to make sense of that. But again, you know, I think, I think you don't know the words for that, or you don't know how to frame that at that age of what you're doing. Um, and she finds Lucia ultimately, you know, to be a much more complex character, oddly, than a fictional TV character. And that, that comes with, with pluses and minuses. Yeah, it's funny because my daughter, I'm in New York because my daughter had to have an appendectomy. And so I've been walking around the streets here and I had passed like, I was walking back here at three and there were a lot of school children like looking sullen and like squatting in corners and smoking cigarettes. I wanted to go up and go, oh honey, you're going to regret that later. <laughs> it's out of my business. But you could just see them and they're like trying really hard to be tough, the whole thing. And, and yet they don't look tough at all. That's what I always tough. think of like the image you have of yourself right now, it is not working for the rest of us. Yeah, they look like we children. Like they make them look younger almost to do it. So anyway, so now it seems to me there's an interesting continuum in your books. Like they sort of, you would, I didn't even know you'd written a middle grade book. This was news to me. But um, do you feel like there's a sort of a, a connective tissue between them all? Is it the mother thing or does there, there nothing? Like, because mine are not really very similar, except that they're silly. You know, they're funny. So. I... Now that distracted me to think about the ways that I think your two are, are maybe like. Um, I can I... tell. Mine, are, mine aren't, they're certainly not all about motherhood. Um, I think there are certainly themes that interest me, but would they run through all of them? Probably not. Uh, uh, mothering does interest me. The notion of doing the right thing of making a difference. Yeah. Um, it's a bit out of fashion, but I, I you know, I, I find good much more interesting than evil. I I'm find, good, um, and so that may run through. I think I tend to have characters who are trying to figure out how to do the right thing. And ideally, you know, not in a Pollyannish way, but in, in the way of a complex human being wrestling with how do I do good? Um, but there are all sorts of different settings. And so, uh, yeah, I don't, you know, I, they're not, there are not a lot of obvious threads between them. But I think that's probably why I like your books too, because I don't like the book, the books that I call the books of unnecessary suffering, where you feel like you've been punished. Like right. I, I do that I had to do this, this thing and like live through this misery. I don't mind some misery. I enjoy some misery, but there <laughs> needs to be something at the end that makes you makes it worth that make that gives you some hope some measure of hope in there yeah so hey yeah, um, i mean your books your books always make me feel good okay. and i do like that that i that, yeah i don't want to write why would i want to write a book that left me miserable the whole time i was writing it that seems there with seems it rough i mean it's um, miserable enough when it's a happy story <laughs> And I guess that's another thread. I mean, I, I tend to write characters who I like. Again, they're not perfect. They may get on my nerves occasionally. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't mean everyone likes them, which is always surprising to me. But um, but yeah, I, I do tend to want to, I want to root for the person, even if they've screwed up. Um, I, I want to root for them at the end of the day. Yeah. See, mine always have, they send, tend to my both. I've only written two. Um, Hollywood adjacent. Mm -hmm. and um a lot of dumb jokes so <laughs> they're pretty much they're not dumb they're laugh out loud jokes <laughs> yes always okay. there's a, always a lot of little smiley faces drawn in my copies of your books uh, oh that's nice i'd like to see oh, maybe i'll get to see it next week when i see well, you. i'll show you i'll show you your own books that'll be fun well i did an event for the new york public library with the first book a long time ago and the guy brought his book up for me to sign it and he had underlined and written notes in the side and i was like wait a minute everybody shh, I gotta read that because you know, I was dying to know like because I can't even believe that somebody who's not a member of my family has read anything I've written so that was it's so exciting to see one all marked up and oh. underlined and yeah to realize what I mean that's a fun thing I think that you know that each person who reads it has a different experience and you read their notes and you get their experience that 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 part is really fun to to see in some way what did this person make of this and what was the final product because yeah, that's what i like doing book groups is they tell me stuff and i'm like that makes sense yes i did that on purpose yeah right. and a lot of subconscious <laughs> genius going on oh yeah yeah just like a it's up, up waist deep sometimes so 
And I will say, I think we're getting close to, if we had questions, we could yeah. take them. I was just gonna give a little shout out to anybody who wants to add a question to the chat. Now might be a good time. Did I just steal your thunder, Megan? It's okay. I say it all the time. I'm happy to have someone else say it. Um, we actually have a couple questions in the Q&A and then okay, one in the chat. I'm doing something wrong here. So. No, you're probably not doing anything wrong, but it's fine. I'll read them. Okay. You can take a break. <laughs> oh, look elegant. <laughs> Great. <laughs> cigarette in the cigarette holder. Yes. I don't know why you didn't bring it. <laughs> <laughs> the kids on the street, they all had them. So. <laughs> Um, okay, so a couple questions. One is, Jen, do you have any other Mothers You Choose books you would recommend? Mm -hmm. Really hard hitting right at the beginning. <laughs> this is always, I've always said like the worst questions, not that question is bad. The toughest questions always involve like, what have you read or what have you liked? Because as soon as you ask them, like every thought of every book is gone. Oh, what I was trying I, to think of, I was trying to think, and you may have one, Julia, I was trying to think of something. So I consider this a really, a really positive relationship uh, of someone who's, um, yeah, is sort of seeking out an, a model and, and finds a good one. Mm -hmm. Again, not without problems. Uh, J. Courtney Sullivan's last book. Um, oh yeah. <laughs> like friends and friends and something yeah. i'm confusing it with lovers and writers by lily king it's not yeah. friends and lovers friends and friends and strangers not family but wait you might be right friends and strangers sounds right that's it that's it um so anyway that is the only book i mean i i don't whoever asked this i don't know if you're aware of how much you're supposed to find comps comparative books mm -hmm. uh, when you name your book. And so you're, I, one part I spent a lot of time doing was trying to find any books in the last five years about this sort of relationship. Um, and it was really striking to me. I, I read a lot. I don't read a lot the two weeks after my own book comes out, but <laughs> otherwise I do uh, read a lot. Um, and so, yeah, it was really striking that I, I cannot think of many. That book, Friends and Strangers, which I liked, is a darker book than this is that relationship is fraught so i i wouldn't loop i wouldn't loop them together um and yeah no everyone i mean no the other one that came to mind was um uh julia finds margaret weiss julia finds book about um being haunted by the ghost of margaret weiss brown Oh. kind of like a kind of like a mother figure yeah, 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 yeah. but it's not it's dark too it's not yeah. nothing nothing good happens with that ghost <laughs> it's yeah. a it's a funny bonkers book uh but it's not you know it's it but it's not kind of the thing Austin. <laughs> don't you feel like you've never read a book in your life when somebody asks you that question and my husband's a comedy writer and he showed me this funny clip and i can't think of who the comedian is but he's talking about i'm so and so I've written more books than I've read. <laughs> yeah, that's usually how it feels. I will say this isn't the question uh -huh. that you asked, but um, a book I really, really love about motherhood is Susan Connolly's Landslide. Oh, and I know. Megan or Julia, have either one of y'all read that? Read it. It's set in Maine. It came out this year maybe january or february and it's just about a mother of two teenage boys her, her husband has just been injured on a um fishing and a fishing accident um and it's just spectacular it's funny it's um incredibly moving and it's just sort of a glimpse of this family and it's a great and of someone who's who's happy with their life who there's there may be obstacles there may be tension but she is fundamentally happy with the people she loves and the work that she does. And I'm a sucker for a compelling book that still has contentment at the core of it. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd like to apparently take your question that I can't answer well and just substitute a different question. Well, <laughs> <I'm in> <laughs> I think we got some wrecks out of it. So that's all that matters. <laughs> um, okay, so. Someone else asked, um, did you have to do any research other than legal research? Did you find out anything else surprising in your research? I think referencing sort of the, what you were talking about with the 
like the sure was sort of the laws at the time yeah. and the um let's see I mean this is this is certainly related but to hear someone list the things that men that judges and other lawyers that in the middle of a professional setting could say to you in the 80s was astonishing to me um and just that was sort of a, a lot of the things that men say to Lucia, uh, like there's one about um, a judge saying when she asks, I think for a continuance for a judge to say, um, I'd grant you all the continuances you want if I could watch your sweet ass walk out of this courtroom. I forgot about that. Um, yeah, that's I mean, that's real. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so that part, it's not exactly legal work. And I talked to other, I mean, I didn't, I didn't just talk to the one woman. I did talk to other women about their experiences. And so that angle of it, of sort of what was still considered, I don't know if acceptable is right, but what was considered behavior that there, where you had no recourse mm -hmm. um, was really surprising. Again, not just in the time frame that, I, that, that had you said that to me about the 1940s, uh -huh. um, had we gone back to when your book was set, Julia, then it might've felt like, oh, sure. But yeah, 80s felt a lot more recent than I would have expected, where you could still just basically say whatever you wanted to a woman and she would need to smile and move along. I, you know, in mine, I read a memoir of a, a judge who was the most famous divorce judge in Reno, Nevada at the time. And his name was George Bartlett. And just like the list of things that people would like, they had to have some excuse for getting divorced. So it'd be like, he hated my hats. <laughs> He played his music very loud when I was trying to read. It was stuff like that. I mean, there were- but That was enough. That would that enough. would do it? They just, needed, they just needed an excuse. So, and there were horrible ones too, but some of them were just laughable, you know? And they were just like, okay, see you later. And then he would gavel, hit his gavel and divorce him and say, better luck next time, which is where the mm -hmm. name of my book came from. And I love the fact that there were people who would get married like, immediately and times and when they walk across the hall and get married again you could pay extra to have a, a private you know divorce hearing versus in court where people were listening so like I think maybe Barbara Hutton like millionaires would do it it was crazy <laughs> it was so fun to read you know and yet so very close to the home still you know? right no I think I think the 70s or when no fault divorce started in Alabama, right before it was before the scope of a family law, but it did change everything. Oh yeah. Just, yeah. To just be able to get a divorce because you don't want to be married anymore. Yeah. So, no had excuses. <laughs> oh man. He didn't open the taxi door for me. Oh my God, it was crazy. So anyway. Um, someone in the chat wrote, you have written so many genres slash types of books. It seems like they were struggling with which to say. How do you decide what you're going to write next? Given the variety of what you've written, it does feel like different headspaces or yeah. very different headspaces. I mean, I think in some ways, particularly the middle grades, I've had two middle grades and both of those sort of made a nice break, a nice sort of palate cleanser from a from a longer book that involves more research. Um, you know, there's a lot of waiting spaces when you write, where you're waiting to get feedback or that's going out to the editor. And so a lot of times there are these weird five or six month spans where you, and the, the, the middle grade books worked well for that. I could, both of those I wrote in about four or five months. And so they just sort of used that time wisely. Um, I don't know. I'm always curious if other writers have a more sort of like, um, I don't know, a more pragmatic sense of this. I write what pops into my head and I write what won't leave my head. The, the, like the last book, uh, Fierce Kingdom, I came home from the zoo one day with my child, sort of thinking about the notion of, of setting a book in a zoo, um, a, a book about motherhood during a public shooting. Mm -hmm. and thought that seems odd um mm -hmm. and then maybe a week later my husband came home and was like hey what were you working on and I said I'm actually working on the zoo book and he went wait that was a real idea <laughs> no I think it is 
<laughs> but I, I do think that's more how that works that I may have multiple things pop into my head, but the ones that turn into books are the ones that stick for days or weeks and where I wind up feeling like I've got to just jot, just see where this goes. Um, and I think they are maybe different in part because I don't, I mean, I think I'd probably sell more books if I'd write the same thing over and over, if I would just stick to only writing thrillers uh -huh. or whatever. But, you know, the truth is it's more fun to write when it's different. Marketing people hate you to say that or think that, but, you know, if I've spent a year on a story, um, I'm ready to pick a different setting, to pick a different tone and really different characters and to to challenge myself with playing with some with something else. Uh, so, you know, yeah, I think, I'd, I suppose maybe I could have said much more shortly, it never feels like there's a lot of a choice about what I write next. It just yeah. feels like it's there. And I mean, it's not fully formed. That'd be great if it just was right. done. But instead it is like, that is the thing that won't leave my head. And so that's mm -hmm. what I focus on. I think that, um... I don't know. I think readers like it when writers surprise them in terms of like, oh, I thought it was going to be like, you know, especially if they've written more than, you know, a handful of books. Like, so I think the marketing people are wrong. I think that's they should a lovely have. thought. I'm mean, always thinking about like Ann Patchett, who I love and who yeah, very different books. There are going to be some themes, but they're all going to be very different. And I love that. Yeah. That, mm -hmm. I, that I don't know what I'm going to be opening up. So yeah. I have the hope that you're right. I feel like the people I'm selling books to care about that. So. <laughs> and that's a huge subsect of the population. So I don't know why people don't ask me. Um, <laughs> um, okay. We have another one. I really enjoyed your book or enjoyed the book. <laughs> I'm assuming it's yours. Um, Thank you. I'm just going to go ahead and assume it is. Thank you. <laughs> you have such strong characters. Did you start with the characters in this book or did you start with the plot? I will always start with characters. Um, in this one, I started with Lucia and then sort of added Rachel, but you know, I don't, I'm never sure how people do the plot first. Um, but it all, because it always feels like you've got to at least get to the point where you know what your character wants, what they care about. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, and maybe what they care about is what they're going to be threatened with losing, or maybe they're still trying to get it, but the main engine of the plot feels so connected to who that person is and what they care about, mm -hmm. um, what they fear, what they want more than anything. But so, you know, if I had, and instead, I, I always wind up with sort of a, a world, every single freaking book, like the world and the characters are there. And then I'm trying to figure out like, what's an interesting domino to, uh -huh. to knock over um, mm -hmm. and what then what might happen and what would sort of open them up in interesting ways. Mm -hmm. um, my first book, The Well in the Mind, there's a, a baby down a well mm -hmm. and that happens sort of right early on. And in some ways, it's not that different from Fierce Kingdom or this book or maybe any other book ever written with the notion that you set a world in motion and then you figure out how do I sort of tilt that world off the axis just enough to shake everyone out of their position, to get all the marbles rolling, mm -hmm. and then let's see where they roll. Mm -hmm. okay. Because I know with my books, when I'm, I'm trying to read funny books, and so I decide something's going to happen, and then I try to think of the most mortifying way it could possibly happen, and having spent most of my life being incredibly embarrassed by everything I do, it seems I have a knack for it. <laughs> do you not start with character? Do you not? So do oh, you not so start with characters? Okay. But, um, but yeah, but then when I'm like, but then okay. you figure out what's embarrassing for those characters. <laughs> exactly. It's like, or that people think will be embarrassing for them, and they're like, I don't care. Because no, I love that. Yeah, because there's a one scene in my book where there's an opportunity for somebody to expose somebody else completely naked, and she just uh, just gets up and like picks a book up, looks through it says hello to everybody, walks out of the room. And I was just like, to be that person, to like be able to just <laughs> not be embarrassed by that, that would be awesome. So <laughs> anyway. Okay, this is the last question and I'm gonna direct it towards both of you because it's useful in my life. Um, it says, uh, of course now I've lost it. Um, 
who do you envision as the ideal reader for each of your books? You go first. Then I can George Clooney. <laughs> there you go. Right now, no, George Clooney is not my ideal reader. Um, <laughs> but it is always a good answer to any question. I find. Um, good reading it. <laughs> huh? Um, that's a really interesting question. Uh. You know what, while you're thinking, I'm going to say- Do you something. have a real answer immediately? I don't, but I'll tell you something interesting. It's like the <laughs> book that I wrote, a lot of women who've read it said, I gave it to my daughter. And a lot of the daughters have said, I gave it to my mother. And I was like, oh, it's a mother-daughter book. Who knew? I didn't know when I was going in that it was a mother-daughter book. But because there's like a, a tense uh, relationship between a 13-year-old and her mother, like yours, sort of, mm -hmm. except different. Um, people really respond to that and that made me very happy. So I didn't know that was the group I wanted, but now I'm pretty excited about it, so. Okay, I thank you. That did give me enough time to come up with some sort of halfway intelligent answer. Um, I think what strikes me about feedback, a lot of times what people don't like about my books are maybe um, somebody who thought it might be more standard thriller or, um, or escapist and so who are frustrated by maybe too much character or an ending that's open-ended um, and so I think maybe that's sort of a weird mix that a weird that an ideal reader would be someone who does want to think and add their own part to the book who who doesn't want me to answer every question but who also wants to feel good at the end of the book um, that it's not escapist, but again, I, I like contentment. I like people who are comfortable with themselves and who have carved out a life that they're happy with. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and, you know, in some ways when that's threatened, that's, that's a particular kind of tension when you, when you have something that you love and are happy with. So I, I do think of them as books that leave you feeling good about humanity. <laughs> Uh, but, but where you are not going to have every question answered and where, you know, ideally a reader is going to add their own experience and come up with something interesting. I think that, that both of those were great answers. <laughs> um, and we did sell a lot of them for Mother's Day. So, oh, did you? Did you make sense. Yeah. Um, and that's it. That, that's, that's our nice. Those are our questions. I <laughs> I thank you both so much for doing this. I want to remind everyone that you can order both books through us. They're signed. We will give them to you any way we can. For the we will, we will sign more of them. You can yeah. buy everything they have and we would happily send some more over there. Yeah, exactly. we, would. Yeah. We, we would ask them to do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I just want to thank you guys so much for being here. This was great. It was a really enjoyable conversation. I can't wait to keep selling the books. Both of them. Thank you, Megan. And thank you everybody for coming. We so appreciate you being there and um, buying the books, thinking about the books. Mm -hmm. You make this really so fun. The books you read so that when somebody asks you, you can remember. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. I, I have to say when you guys were talking about that, I was like, few people come in and they're like oh it's a book about blah, blah blah I'm like oh yeah the one with the dog and the and then I just go get it for them because I couldn't tell you the name or the title and that's my whole job <laughs> you know somebody who's but you find it but yeah. I know where it is I know where it is I know somebody who's kept a list of every book she's read since she's 13 and a notebook and I'm so envious I'm wow. so envious I can hardly stand it why didn't I do that Oh my gosh, that takes a level of commitment that I could never have. <laughs> I'm kind of blown away. Yeah. Okay. But thank you. Thanks, Megan. Thank, thank you, Julia. Thank you for being here. Buy the book. Can't wait to see you in person. Yes, see you soon. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.